Tuesday, April 6, 2021. If everybody could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Call, please. Mrs. Yetzi. Here. Mrs. McCarthy. Here. Mrs. Saxon. Here. Mrs. Tamira. Here. Mr. Vaca. Here. Finalization of the agenda. Is there anything to add and or delete? There is not. The agenda is final and presented. Outstanding. We'll move right into the superintendent treasurer's report, then, please. All right. Well, great. Thank you very much, President Vaca, members of the Board of Education. Um, it is my pleasure to fill in for Roxanne Ramsey Casaria tonight, and we have two reports for the superintendent's report. Um, the first is we plan for the 2021-20 school year and looking for a five-day in-person return in August, anxiously awaiting that. We also understand that circumstances this year uh, with the hybrid model may have led to some learning gaps for students. And so today what we would like to present to the board is our extended learning plan. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Pritt to present the details of the extended learning plan for learning recovery for students. Mr. Pritt. Thank you, Mr. Hearn. We are certainly excited to begin, um, you know, to plan for what's coming this coming summer, um, to look into next school year, particularly with the students coming back five days a week. And as you said, and rightly so, you know, we're realistically looking at not just gaps from, you know, a, a hybrid year, but we're looking to gaps all the way back to really March of last year to where schools kind of shut down. I feel like we've done the best job that we can in the current situation that we have. So now let's start looking at how do we make sure that our students are successful as possible moving forward. And that's really where the um, extended learning plan comes in. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you and talk through some of the highlights of the plan. Um, I will tell you that it is not the plan in its entirety. The plan in its entirety is available on the school's website. So I just want to make sure that we know that first and foremost, that we're really just going to hit some of the highlights here today. So, um, so a bit of background on the extended learning plan. The governor on back in February, early February, called for each school to develop an extended learning plan to help students recover from the loss of education that's occurred over really the last year and um, three months or so. So we asked for that to be created. It was not mandated. It was a um, request that schools create that and to do so by April 1st. And I am happy to say that we have met that deadline. Um, we have shared it with the Ohio Department of Education. It is posted on their website with a link back to our website. And I think what's important to know really comes on this next page. And that is that what you're going to see today is really a working document and a working draft. You know, we anticipate where our students are right now. We know where some of these gaps exist based on data that we have, but we also know that as we move into next school year, um, as we move next through next school year, we're still going to have gaps that we have to address. So it's important for me to have everyone or for everyone to recognize that this really is an ongoing document and it's going to be a document that takes us through the next year, next year and a half to get students to where they need to be. Second piece of that's important is, as I said, the full document itself is on our website at nrcs.net. And then most importantly, I think it's important to notice also is to the, thank the people that have had a say in this. Um, so I need to thank Mrs. Vance out of uh, pupil personnel, Dr. Miller out of my department, um, Dana Edgers, the BLTs at each building have discussed these. Um, we've done a survey with the community, got about 325 responses or so there. Um, so it's really taken a lot of different pieces and pulling together where we think we are right now. So um, kudos to all of those groups. We wouldn't be in this spot, you know, without that piece. So the plan has six components. It addresses impacted students. It addresses a needs assessment, resource and budget approaches, partnerships and alignments. And really the two that I wanna focus on you know, tonight are that resources and budget piece and the approaches. And what's critically important for all of us with the resources and budget is that whatever we propose in our plan does not provide a burden, an additional burden to our families. So the things that you're going to see tonight that we're talking about implementing are things that are going to be free of cost to our families. You know, we're going to look to provide this either out of general fund or ESSER funds that have come through the federal government to make sure that our students are getting the opportunities that they need um, at no additional cost to our families. And I think that's critically important um, regardless of where we are. So we've really broken our plan into three pieces. And the first one are things that are happening now during the 2021 school year. 
And what's important to note about this is we did not wait to be required to put together an extended learning plan. Some of these things that you're gonna see bulleted here are things that we've been doing since the beginning of the school year. Um, our second bullet point there where we talk about providing reading intervention for our struggling students in grade one through three. If you remember, we did a presentation on this back in January. And that's because we had started this process really back in December when we realized that we had some gaps that existed. So the district was proactive in putting some of these things in place and we hope to continue to be you know, moving down the road. Um, we've got a, a schedule that's going to allow for some additional AP um, in-person time prior to our AP exams that happen in May. Uh, we've looked, we've expanded our Ranger Academy, which is all alternative programming at the high school. You know, during the 2021 school year, we've provided some in-person monitoring for select high school students that we recognize are really struggling and actually are taking another step to that and have a group of students that we're going to be looking to bring in four days a week in order to offer live instruction to our students that are most at risk. So later on tonight in your agenda, actually, you'll see an increase in staffing um, for one of the people to make that happen. So kind of the quick overview of where we are 2021 and then really where we're going to ramp things up will be over the course of the summer and into the next school year. So in summer of 2021, we have traditionally done a, a six week summer school, you know, based on the feedback from the community, they're really looking at two different things. One of those is to kind of split those sessions. So we're going to have a three week session that's offered right after school is out. And then we're going to do something we've not done before. We're going to do a two week session just before school starts back up. And that does a couple things for us that allows us to remediate on the backside of school, but it also allows us to get students ready for starting school, um, which was a big point that um, families and community pointed out was making sure that students are ready to go. In some cases, we'll have students that haven't been physically in person in a year and a half. So we're going to want to make sure that they have the, the skills to get back into that classroom, to get back into those routines. Um, we're also making a change to our summer school. For the last eight or nine years, um, you know, our middle school and up programs have all been APEX based. But we've looked at our things and we recognize that some of our students need more in-person time. So in our algebras, our geometry, our English ones, our English twos, we're actually going to live teach those again. So we'll have students in person with a live instructor. And then we'll look at some of those non-tested areas that will still move forward with the APEX piece. Uh, we're tentatively working through a science camp with a couple of our community partners. I don't know which of those we're going to land on right now. A big piece of that format came back from parents and what they were willing to have their students attend. So we're kind of working through that, make sure we can get those numbers. Um, something I'm really excited about is the fact that we're not just looking on the academic side of things. So we're looking at some social emotional camps, um, bringing in students a day a week to get them back to socializing, to get them some opportunities to interact with students, um, get them outside, whether they're playing games or whatever that happens to be, so that we're meeting those social emotional needs. Uh, the return to school sessions we've talked about, we've worked with Mr. Hieronymus to look into offering some distance learning opportunities like we did last summer as well. Um, and those will be the type of things that student can drop into. And then other items are honestly going to be as we go and just what our student needs are. So we identify those needs and address them. The two big challenges that we're facing with any of this obviously is enrollment and two, making sure that we've got the staffing to make these programs run. And if we're concerned about anything, that's the piece. We opened up our summer school registration for teachers in the last week. I'm encouraged by the number of people who have said, yeah, I'd be willing to do something. So I think that's a concern is just general teacher burnout every, with everyone I've talked to and how do we make these things staff and how do we make them run? The other important thing about these summer opportunities is these are the type of things that we are looking to open up to anyone. So obviously we'll have our students that we recommend because we think you'd be a good fit for blank. But if a parent says, you know what, I think my student needs, we're not going to turn them away provided we have that space. And then as we look into the 2021 2022 school year, we've got a couple of other things we're looking to do, um, trying to implement an intervention block for all of our students, um, you know, K through um, 12. And that's something that we've been trying to do for a couple of years now. We were in a position this year to do it in a couple of our buildings, but when we had to shorten the school day, that kind of went away. So I think we're in a good place for that. Um, one of the real strong offerings that parents said I'd have an interest in was our K-4 tutoring in math and ELA. So currently we're just doing the ELA. We'd like to add the math to that. And then the homework support hub for students in grades five through 12. And for that, we're looking for a place where students can just drop in. It doesn't have to be a daily thing. It could be, hey, I'm struggling with this concept. Stop in, get that help, and then get on your way. So we're excited about getting that in place. Um, expanded credit recovery for our students. And we need, we know that that's going to exist. So we'll look to do some things before this year is over. Obviously, over the course of the summer with the summer school program. And then the credit recovery moving into next year. And then again, I, I can't stress this one enough. So 
those other items that are identified as student needs. So pupil personnel ourselves, we meet monthly um, at least to talk through things. And I think this is just going to be one of those recurring things that we continue to see on an agenda. So that is the 10,000 foot view of, of a topic that's kind of got a lot of pieces to it. But I wanted to make sure that you were in the loop kind of where we are because you'll be seeing things come through board agendas to help support these things. So I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Hey, David, thank you for um, the, the presentation. Um, can you please share that with the board? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Okay. Share that out shortly. The next, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is that this is for students who have been identified as struggling, correct? So that well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. There is a component in the first part about how you identify students to where we talk about using um, progress monitoring scores and things like that, but that would not necessarily exclude another student from participating in any of these activities. Okay. It's voluntary for, for those ones then? Okay. It is voluntary. And that was one of the, some of the feedback that we got through the parent survey was we had some parents that were very adamant about not having their kids do anything over the summer. And that's something that we need to respect. Okay, thanks. The next question is um, when will parents and students know if they um, are recommended for these programs? Yeah, that's a great question. So our next step in the process would be to get the summer school brochure approved. My hope to do that would be probably at our next board meeting here in two weeks. And then typically what happens is right after that occurs, so probably late April, 1st of May, we'll have principals and teachers start reaching out to students that we have identified and then we'll also market the other things that are happening so that if somebody says, my child needs that, they've got the opportunity to opt in. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Perrett, um, again, awesome job on the presentation. Um, I appreciate other items as identified by student needs was the last bullet point of each one of those slides. Um, for the community's sake, is that not our common practice, even pre-pandemic, that we address these needs as needed, and we've been proactive since the pandemic started uh, in regards uh, to trying to look out for these needs? Yeah, you're absolutely correct on that, Mr. Vaca, and that's why you saw, like I said, some of those intervention programs start all the way back, you know, before the school year even turns. So that is standard practice for us. The difference this time is it's formalized on a plan. Um, so really, it's the paperwork piece of it and, and the awareness piece, I think, that we don't always do a great job of. Great. I appreciate it. I just want the community to really understand how proactive the administration and our teachers and staff have been throughout this entire pandemic. And the only thing that's really changed for us is due to the pandemic, there's a greater need in a larger part of our student population that might require additional services. So we're on top of it. We've always been on top of it. We'll stay on top of it. Is that a fair assumption? That is 100% accurate to the best of our ability. Um, you know, our, our goal is student success. And, and when we recognize there's a goal, we're going to address that. And that's, you know, as you said, great work on the administrative parts and most importantly, the teachers part who work with our students on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I have a question, Mr. Pritt. Um, this maybe doesn't uh, pertain to the summer extended learning, but you were discussing about online students and hybrid, particularly the high school students um, and that social emotional piece, um, getting back into the actual high school next year. Some of those students have never taken courses in the high school. I'm sure you guys have something that you're planning, um, but is there anything that you're ready to share with the board and with the community about that? I've had some questions, just parents who are concerned. No, and that's a great question. You know, some of those things obviously would be, um, you know, increasing tours of the building so students know where they're going, um, you know, offering additional opportunities for students to be in the building and be involved, I think are the critical pieces of that right now. So uh, we don't have firm dates on that, so I can't provide those to you yet, but it's certainly something, you know, we'll continue to, you know, kind of as we plan out here, work through. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pritch, maybe just a suggestion on that front. Um, at colleges, a lot of times your orientation for your freshmen coming in is, um, for lack of better words, is fairs to show, okay, we got drama club, we have this. Maybe it might be worthwhile to offer something like that where we bring out all the extracurriculars and those involved during the summer months and get kids in here and expose them 
to what opportunities they missed out potentially on their freshman year so that we really have a good grasp on what we offer and what each one of those groups do so that when they come in here as sophomores and incoming freshmen, they can hit the ground running having an idea of what they want to do and what each one of those groups or what each one of those extracurriculars look like. Just a thought. Yeah, no, I like that idea. Typically, we have handled that through like our ninth grade orientation night, but it's different when you do that through Zoom than it is when you actually hear from students. So, um, certainly, we can have that conversation with the high school and, and see what that might be able to look like. I appreciate this uh, the suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Prick? Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Pritt and everybody that worked on that plan. Uh, the next item uh, in the superintendent's report is a report from Ms. Vance, the director of pupil personnel regarding the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee and training that we've done this year. Ms. Vance. Hi. Hi. How's everybody doing tonight? I would uh, like to take this opportunity to share with you some information um, as Mr. Ahern had shared around diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm gonna share with you my screen. There it is. Just a slide, slide ahead. All right. Um, so what we'd like to share with you is that um, I, along with many other people here in the district, have been um, a part of a group that has been working since November of 2018. Obviously, I joined the group um, as I started here in North Ridgeville, um, and I have been very impressed with the work that they have been working on to evaluate and look at um, the unintended barriers that we face around equity and inclusion, um, not only within our district, but many schools uh, face, um, not only within the students, but also within the staff and sometimes within the community. This group is looking to to make sure that our schools create equitable um, and intellectually rigorous and culturally responsive learning environments, um, honoring differences while embracing shared values of our students, uh, creating a safe environment that encourages the expression of differences and the ways we invite dialogue um, and education rather than cause alienation within our classrooms, within um, our staff members having conversations and also within the community, encouraging curiosity and inquiry to be open to learning from diverse um, ranges of experiences and points of view. And finally, recognizing that conversations around equity and inclusion are complicated, um, but it's a worthwhile to have these conversations around important issues and that by doing so, we increase the strength of our organization. As we started, looking at these areas, we had identified that we needed to do some professional development. Um, and we started with a training um, of unconscious bias through Franklin Covey. And we did this back in October of 2020. The entire administrative team that included all supervisors in the district participated in this. Um, it, it was a very engaging uh, training that we participated in. And the day was focused directly on understanding our own personal biases and how um, our biases can improve our approach um, to the interpersonal and organizational communication that we engage in day to day, um, not only in our school environment, but in our day to day um, interactions within our communities. Um, that's just a picture uh, replicating um, the time that we spent. Uh, we've been using meeting over in the multi purpose room over at the high school. Um, during that time, after we um, participated in this day, it allowed us an opportunity to reflect and identify that we wanted to take it a little bit further. And we had contacted um, ELA, which is called the Effective Leadership Academy that is located here in Northeast Ohio, and uh, talked with them about what they could do to provide us some additional support to further um, develop our understandings of uh, our unconscious biases and also to develop 
um, and empower us to work not only within our the practices that we have and procedures that we have in our school district, but to engage conversations with our staff and our students and the community at large. And so they came up with a training that was called Leading with an Idea. Um, they have let us know very clearly. We are one of the first districts in the north northeastern um, area um, that is working on these concepts. And that is very empowering to me as an educator to be a part of a group that is doing something on the front lines. Um, the main focus of this training focused on inclusivity, the diversity, empowerment, um, empathetic leadership, and the action that um, we all have um, to do now that we've had this training. Um, as a result of this training that we went through, we were able to identify some goals and action plans that we would like to focus on. This is a list of those. Um, they're going to focus on engaging our students to participate in cross-cultural cross -cultural experiences, um, increasing um, the knowledge around diversity, equity, inclusion for our staff, our students, and our community. We already have trainings established that are going to be coming up over the upcoming year to establish and accomplish that goal, um, working to increase um, diversity among staff, um, looking to um, expand uh, diversity um, and providing diverse reading materials to our uh, students within their classrooms, um, collaborating on how the school and the community work together, and then finally um, condu conducting an equity audit. Even though that's the number six goal, that's probably one of the first things that's going to happen at the very beginning of the next school year, um, but knowing that that this is not something that we can do alone. This is something that takes everyone um, that touches um, North Ridgeville City Schools. And it, it doesn't only impact our students when they're in the building, it impacts them when they are at home and it impacts them when they are in the community at large. As a result of participating in this, we also were um, uh, early, mid-February, we were we identified that there was a grant um, that came out of diversifying the education profession. And Mr. Hearn and myself, along with the diversity group, um, had to work very quickly to apply for this grant. And we were awarded um, a $70,000 grant to um, diversify education profession. And we have two goals that we would like to accomplish with the funds uh, with this grant. First was to build a culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it's to continue what I just presented to you. So we knew we had a start, but we have a long way to go um, in order to continue what we have started. So as we um, start next year, it is to take the training that we started with and take it to all of our staff. Every single staff member that works in this district will receive the same training that we went through. And then we will work with our staff to build training that goes to our students and then ultimately to the community. So that is a huge um, undertaking that we would like to accomplish. Um, and that is ultimately another way that we will review our district policies and procedures to maximize equity and inclusion. The second piece of this grant is the option and the ability to attract and recruit and retain a a more diverse workforce. Um, so one of our goals is to recognize the value of diversity and inclusion um, and help to look at our hiring practices and also looking to help to have our workforce um, to be reflective of students that are in our community and attending our schools. So that is a piece of um, the grant that we will also be working on. So we are very excited uh, that we were selected to be a part of this grant um, and are looking forward to working collaboratively with um, the Ohio Department of Education um, and all the other um, districts that received the grant and work alongside them as we develop our diversity, equity, and inclusion within the District of North Ridgeville City Schools. So that is a little summary of information. And does anybody have any questions? I'd just like to um, say, Ms. Vance, thank you for the presentation. Um, but also, congratulations to you and Mr. Hearn and to the entire committee um, who worked so hard on that grant and um, secured $70,000 for this project. 
um, which really is going to be invaluable to our to our district and to our community. It's going to the um, I think the value is going to far exceed seventy thousand um, dollars. So that's amazing. I had the opportunity to read the entire grant. Um, a lot of work went into that <laughs> clearly. So thank you for all of that and for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Vance. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how this is uh, brought forth in the district. I'm, I'm very excited and proud that we are one of the uh, few districts in the Northeast. So uh, again, congratulations um, on the grant and um, good luck and, and you know, let us know if there's anything that we can do to, to help and assist as you move forward. Thank you. I'm assuming that we'll, as a board, that we'll have an opportunity to participate at some point in the training. Yes, you most likely will. Yes. And in fact, that was something that Mr. Hearn and I had talked about at one point. Um, they, the possibilities are endless. And I, I just would like to, on a side comment, this, this training, I think, I think we all go into a training um, such as this with this title. And I think you have, some people have a preconceived notion about what you're participating in. Um, and I think when we all came out of it, it was very different. And um, it was very reflective of yourself and reflective of the people around you um, and, and the realization and the impacts of unconscious bias and, and helping you recognize that there's so much that are be that is beyond your control um, but it is very informative to you of recognizing and learning what can be within your control to help change practices and to um, you know also be comfortable with having conversations that sometimes are challenging and I know that we as an administrative team are really excited to move through this process okay. with the district. So you will absolutely be involved in moving forward. Thank you. Ms. Vance, outstanding job on the grant. Um, that's always awesome when we have administrators and staff that go out and receive monies that we could utilize here in district. Um, any chance we can get the idea training that's already been provided sent to each one of the board members so we can see what that training looks like and what it entails? I, yeah, I actually do have some resources that has been shared with me. I don't know that we, I can share with you a lot of that, what that has been provided to us. Um, but I don't know that it would have every single detail of it. Um, but we will forward you what we have available. And you've shared with us about unconscious bias and we're already starting mm -hmm. questions about curriculum changes and things that could be coming down the pike. So to be able to address those, especially after tonight's presentation, to be able to answer any of those questions intelligently, um, mm -hmm. or we might not be able to get every detail, just to be able to reassure people and let them know that we've always provided opportunity inclusion, but it always has to be a conscious effort on our part, our staff's part, and our community's part to make sure that that's as much a priority as educating our students. But I'd like to be able to answer those questions with some factual information as far as the training and what it entails. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay. okay. Concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, here's an opportunity of hearing of the public. Uh, this is an opportunity for members of the public to address the Board of Education regarding items of interest. Questions you may have and or any requested follow-up information will be directed to the most appropriate administrator and follow-up will occur after the board meeting. If you have comments for the Board of Education, please use the raise hand feature and provide your name and address. Your comments are limited to three minutes with a total of 30 minutes that are allowed for this portion of the board meeting. For further guidance on public participation, please reference board policy 0169.1. If you have any questions, we will note them and the most appropriate person to answer your question will get back to you in a reasonable time frame. So we'll go ahead and open up uh, hearing of the public at this time. Thank you, Mr. Vaca. At this time, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, for anyone who is looking on how to do that, you could do that through the reactions option, which should give you the ability to do that, or you can also do it from the, from the participant tab.
And with that, it looks like we do not still do not have any hands raised. So I will we can turn it right back over to you, Mr. Vodka. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move into the consent agenda, uh, education report, Mr. Mira. Thank you. We have two items for your consideration under the education report. The first item is an agreement with the Educational Service Center of Lorain County. It is an annual county service agreement, which includes the following universal services, participation in speech and language, supervisory services, audiological services, behavior specialist support services, gifted and talented supervisory services, and parent mentor services. The agreement also includes specialized district services of a board certified behavior analysis and two district social workers. The ESC of Lorraine County also provides pathways to success and consortium preschool education programming services to the Northridgeville City Schools. The second item is to amend the calendar for the 2021-2022 school year to reflect the changes in the kindergarten start date and the elimination of the Calamity Makeup Day in May of 2022. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move into um, communications report. Ms. Yetzi. It is recommended that the Board of Education accept the following gifts with appreciation. A total of $13,268 in grants is being awarded to NRCS staff for the 2020-2021 school year from the Endowment Fund Committee Care of the Lorain County Community Foundation from the General Fund $7,655, from the Fine Arts Fund $3,447, from the Shannon Edwards Memorial Fund $2,166. Eight, uh, an, an additional eight wooden step stools were donated by North Ridgeville Kiwanis Club to the Early Childhood Learning Committee. Community, thank you. Uh, we thank our community for their support of our schools and students. We'll move on to the Human Resources Report. Ms. Saxon. Yes, we have several items in the Human Resources Report, three certified staff appointments, two special project supplementals, two supplemental contracts, one non-NREA supplemental contract, six continuing contracts granted, 161 instructional staff limited contracts, one intervention specialist or tutor contract, five healthcare associate contracts, 205 classified support staff contracts, 10 leave replacement non-renewals, 15 hourly tutor non-renewals, five certified staff leaves of absence, four support staff leaves of absence, one administrative staff resignation, two certified staff resignations, one support staff resignation, one Appendix D supplemental contract changes. This is the first reading for these items. The second reading and consideration for approval will be at the April 20th regular meeting. This concludes the Human Resources Report. Thank you. Okay, we move on to the Finance Audit Report. Ms. McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Vaca. Uh, we just have one item this evening, board, for our consideration. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the resolution accepting the amounts and rates as determined by the Budget Commission, authorizing the necessary tax levies and certifying them to the county auditor. I'd like to move that we approve this finance and audit report in one reading. Second. Moved by Ms. McCarthy, second by Ms. Tamira. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. McCarthy? Yes. Mrs. Tamira? Yes. Mrs. Yetzi? Yes. Mrs. Saxon? Yes. Mr. Vaca? Yes. All right, now we'll move into human resources. Ms. Saxon? Sure. We have a few items to consider under the human resources report. Two special project supplementals, one support staff substitute, one certified adjustment. I move to approve the human resources items in one reading. Second. Moved by Ms. Saxon, second by Ms. McCarthy. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Saxon? Yes. Mrs. McCarthy? Yes. Mrs. Yetzi? Yes. Mrs. Tamira? Yes. Mrs. Vaca? Yes. All right. It is recommended that the Board of Education enter into executive session to discuss the employment of public employees. There will be no action to follow. 
Moved by Ms. Tamara, second by Ms. McCarthy. Roll call, please. Mrs. Tamira? Yes. Mrs. McCarthy? Yes. Mrs. Yetzi? Yes. Mrs. Saxon? Yes. Mr. Vaca? Yes. 